Last year, many students differed on their CXE exams as they were afraid of failure due to their level of readiness. This year, Mr. Wilson and his experienced team from tcpacademy.teachable.com is here to help you get exam ready. Subscribe for free to tcp-academy.teachable.com. We offer courses in CXE Biology, HSB, English Language, and many others. There are several offerings to each course. Enroll in one today. Thanks for joining us for a review of the May-June 2024 Biology paper. I'm going to be looking at question two in this video and you can follow definitely for the other questions being answered as we go along. But before we move any further, if you have not yet signed up for biology class, HSB class or agri class, remember, you can sign up with me for the academic year 2024-2025. The ads before would have shown and you are definitely going to be finding some ads at the end. We also had some books on Amazon. We have our new lab manual coming out pretty soon for biology. And we already have some lab books uh, on Amazon there for purchase. So if you want to support us, this is a very good way to support us that we can continue do your reviews and offer the best of all service to you. If you've seen my solution for the January paper, we were looking at meiosis. Now we are back at mitosis. And we're looking at these diagrams and persons might become flustered and just decide not to do this question having seen the diagram. But let us just go through this thing and make sure that it is as easy as can be so in your next time around, if there's a next time around, or as we move forward, we learn to appreciate these. Now, figure two is a series of randomly placed diagrams labeled A to E, showing the stages of mitosis in a plant cell. So I usually use my Andy Dandy formula, which is I for interphase, P for prophase, M for metaphase, A for anaphase, T for telophase, and C for cytokinesis. Now, interphase comes before mitosis. Mitosis is simply prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And then we're going to have cytokinesis. I'm going to help you to identify these. Now, I start by getting my students to understand the math aspect of it first. So M metaphase, you are going to find that the chromatids are aligned pretty much in the center of a cell along the spindle fibers. So it is not this one. So pay attention closely. Look at what's, what, what's happening here. The metaphase is going to be E. They are all aligned here. And I just move away and try not to think about in a straight line. But they are pretty much pretty close to being here. So E, of course, would have been metaphase, right? Because they are lined up in the M for metaphase and M for middle. Then we'd go to anaphase. Here we are going to be seeing them moving to opposite ends of a cell or the spindle fibers. So if you observe, they are turned and now they are moving. Away, away, A for away and A for anaphase. And then we are going to be looking for telophase, where two new cells are being formed. We have two new, new nuclear envelopes being formed with a deployed number of chromosomes, the full number of chromosomes. One, two, three, four would have been the full number of chromosomes. So now that we have these three out of the way, then we need to figure out what is C and what is B. Now, if we look at C, it would be fair to say that these cells have not been divided. So the chromosomes are not visible. And all that happens here is that they exist as a long thin thread we call chromatin thread. So C here, you are not seeing the chromosome. This here is going to be our interface. It's going to start off first. 
and then we are going to have here B being prophase. And during prophase, the chromosome, of course, are going to be shortened and thin. And of course, they are going to duplicate themselves and become visible. And each will contain two identical, of course, chromatids. So that tells us what is happening for this lineup. And I would have used from my handy dandy here to place the letters beside all those. So our first question, how many chromosomes are present in, how many chromosomes are in the parent cell of this plant? Now, if here where we have telophase, we have two new nuclear en envelopes being formed, the diploid number of chromosomes, then we can count one, two, three, four. So the parent cell had four chromosomes. This is mitosis, and it ensures that the diploid number of chromosomes is passed on. That is the full number of chromosomes. Now, using the letters A to E to show the order state, state the stages in the correct order of mitosis, we would have done that just now, but I'll just go back up and show you. Remember, we did this, we looked at using my Andy Dandy formula. I look at IP mat C and I explain what's happening here. The C interface B is, of course, going to be prophase, and E is going to be metaphase, and A is going to be anaphase, and of course, D is going to be telophase. Let me make that correct. There, D of course is going to be telophase. So let us make sure we have it. Our letters are C, D, E, A, D. So we would have earned full marks for that. Say two reasons why mitosis is important to living organisms. Now this is going to be a nice one. One, it maintains a diploid number of chromosomes, a full number of chromosomes. Secondly. It is responsible for growth and repair of damaged cells. Whenever you get a cut or the plant, a limb is broken. That which grows back, it is going to contain the full number of chromosomes. So it ensures that when it repairs, it looks pretty much like the parent would have. There's no variation. Then asexual reproduction is going to be very, very important. Mitosis is very important for that process. Again, to ensure that the diploid number of chromosomes is passed on from Offspring. It also ensures that identical daughter cells are maintained. So there is no variation. The parent and the offspring pretty much look the same and contain the pretty much similar genetic characteristics. So it asks for two. I gave you four. I gave four because this is a review and students might, different students will write different things and everybody wants to know where they are and pretty much that spectrum. List two ways in which genetic variation occurs in living organism. Now, this is going to be a very nice one. During sexual reproduction, we really don't know which sperm will fertilize which egg. So there we are going to be having um, our first set of variation um, alignment in place. And then in meiosis, in prophase one, you're going to be having crossing over. And as the chromosome align themselves along the spindle fiber, you are going to be having that random assortment again. And then that, of course, is going to lead to variation. Now, mutation will also cause variation where there's either addition of addition, substitution, or deletion. Those are definitely going to be causing um, variation. As you would have seen with Down syndrome, so oh, that there asks for two, I gave you three, but meiosis in itself is going to be two. Then we have another thing here. This is the simplest genetic diagram. And I think that CXC probably really love you guys to have sent you this diagram. For us, we call it inheritance of sex or sex determination. The probability of a child being male or female is the same each time a child is conceived. Determine the accuracy of this statement by completing the following genetic diagram. Now, woe be unto those teachers and students who are missing out on the parental phenotype, on the parental genotype, 
and the gametes, and they are only going to the Punnett square. Now, by now, we should know that that is not the correct thing to do. And if you have been doing that, I hope you are corrected now with this explanation. So a parental phenotype. Phenotype is usually that which we can detect by seeing. Um, usually I like to say it is a characteristic that is shown within um, your genetic cross. So here our phenotype is going to be male and female. And of course, our parental genotype for male is usually XY and for female it's represented as XX. When we get down to the gamete, all that we're doing now is to space those chromosomes. So we are spacing X, spacing Y, spacing X, spacing X. All right. So remember, that's all that is done as you're seeing here. And then we are going to get down into the ask the Punnett square. We're going to be looking at the random assortment that takes place here. Are, yes, pretty much. So what we have, it doesn't matter who you put at the top. When you put mommy at the top, which is going to be XX, or daddy at the top, which is XY, I put it inside. It doesn't really matter, right? And then we are going to do our crossing. X times X is like simple algebra. Wherever they intercept, you are going to be writing both. So there's an X we carry down, an X is a Y we carry, there's an X we carry over X. X down, X across. So we end up with a pair of this intersection here, right? Let me just make that very clear. So what we end up with is this intersection here, right? Then we are going to have this intersection here, that I write here, all right? Do all that is. And then the same is going to be true, but usually we write the X before the Y. So X down, Y across, down, Y across. It's important to note here that the XX represents a female, and the XY represents a male. So if you observe, uh, the probability here is that we'll have two female and two male, which results in a 50-50% chance or a one-to-one -one ratio. That's out of a thing or half and half. So whether it want to be 50-50%, or what you, you want to say that it is a it is um half and half, um, whichever way it could be um expressed. Let's look at what's happening here as to the con and F1 generation speaks to the first filial generation. Alright, or the first set of offspring. So the F1 generation shows that the probable outcome is always a phenotypic percentage of 50% male to 50% female. Please always remember to write the phenotype beside your percentage or your ratio or your don't just put 50-50. Make sure you do 50% male to 50% female. All right? That shows that you pretty much understand what you're doing. There is always an equal chance of an outcome being male or female. Now, this is never influenced by the amount of child or children, the number of child or children uh, the mother would have had before. And it has a little bit to do or not, nothing to do with what the, the type of kids that are usually born in the family. There are some family who have a lot of girls, some family who have a lot of boys. But despite that, it is always going to be 50-50. Uh, now, in agriculture, we would look at sperm sexing. But we're not doing sperm sexing as far as I know yet for human. So um, we can't really modify that or determine what the outcome is going to be. In agriculture, we can uh, to make sure that we have optimum yield. List two possible genotype of a female whose father is hemophilic and whose mother is a carrier. It's important here to note that what we want to solve for is for this female, not for the father who is hemophilic, and not for the mother who is a carrier. So for simplicity, what I did, I drew up um, the shortened way of our opponent square here. And I'd place um, mother at top, which is a carrier, and I, of, of course, defined my allele. So H is for normal blood clotting, that's capital H, and common H for the person who is a hemophilia. 
Now, if it if the person is a carrier, then the person is heterozygous for the trait. They are going to be having one capital, as we would say in class, and a common, right? Alternate value. So we have XX. We know that this is a female, and this female is a carrier. Over here, the allele for that particular trait is carried on the X chromosome. So the Y stands free. So daddy is not going to be having both. So if that is an hemophilic, then naturally he's only going to be having that allele on the X chromosome. So when we come across here and we do the X, we realize that one possibility for the offspring is for a girl to be a carrier. When we do the cross here again, the possibility that there could be a girl that will be straight hemophilic. For the boys down here, you'll realize that this boy is going to be normal, normal blood clotting. But this boy over here is going to be hemophilic. Now, this boy is not a carrier. Remember, the allele is only carried on the X chromosome. All right? So there are other cases or other um, instances where alleles are carried on the Y chromosome. For example, you would have seen males who have like ear in the ears. That is something that is confined to male. Because it's carried on the Y chromosome. All right? So here we are looking at X link, right? Not the Y link. I do hope I would have provided enough um, explanation for you. I'm going to be asking you if it was of any substance to you, I'm going to ask you to just drop a sub subscribe here. I want you to like the video and I'd love for you to tell me from which school are you watching this video or which school do you attend? I also want you to follow us on YouTube. There are other platforms, but YouTube is fine. And I want you to contribute to what we do by supporting our books on Amazon. There's a new lab manual with new labs that we are writing. Our labs that pretty much cover content from the syllabus, but these labs are new. We haven't seen them anywhere on the market. They were made by us. And of course, they are pretty much at the CXC level because some of these labs were already assessed for CXC. So we want you to look out for that. It should be out for the new school year. It's going to be an Amazon, and we're going to be doing an ad, and you're going to see it attached to our videos. Again, thanks so much for watching, and make sure you watch this video to the very end so that you can find another interesting video at the end. You can click on it and continue your learning. All the best in your endeavor. I do hope if you did the exam, you are going to be successful. If you are not done the exam as yet, remember to subscribe or sign up, sign up with us for classes.